Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed Butler. Today I'm going to break down some of the key concepts in her piece. So, as I mentioned in the last lecture, and should be clear by now, Butler holds a constructionist view of gender. Gender is constructed, actively if unwittingly, in accordance with social, political, and historical values and ideas. Let's read what she has to say on the topic. Because there is neither an essence that gender expresses or externalizes, nor an objective ideal to which gender aspires, because gender is not a fact, the various acts of gender creates the idea of gender. And without those acts, there would be no gender at all. Gender is, thus, a construction that regularly conceals its genesis. So later, on page 528, Butler reiterates, Gender reality is performative, which means, quite simply, that it is real only to the extent that it is performed. End quote. Remember, gender identity has nothing to do with our physical sex. Society naturalizes the idea that some traits are essentially connected to our genitalia, but there is no biological or genetic reason that, for example, having a penis means you like to play with cars instead of with dolls. So why is it then that toddlers and young children who are too young to be cognizant of any sort of gender performance seem to fall into our predetermined categories of girl and boy? Butler explains this with the concept of sedimentation. My suggestion is that the body becomes its gender through a series of acts which are renewed, revised, and consolidated through time. From a feminist point of view, one might try to reconceive the gendered body as the legacy of sedimented acts rather than a predetermined or foreclosed structure, essence, or fact, whether natural, cultural, or linguistic. Sedimentation is a useful image here. Time travel back to junior high or high school geology. Sediment describes the little bits of dirt and rock and water that are originally suspended but eventually settle to the bottom. That sediment can then build up, smoothing the land surface and creating islands or shoals and sandbars. Sedimented acts, therefore, help us see why gendered acts are so naturalized. It's not as though any one act is the defining characteristic of gender identity, just like one rock or grain of sand doesn't make an island. Many tiny acts build up over time, slowly congealing into something solid. Now remember that the construction of identity is not strictly individual. It's part of society and culture. In the case of the two-year-old boy who picks a truck instead of a doll, Think of the sedimented acts of gender identity that have already been built up around him. The first question we usually ask when a child is born is, is it a boy or a girl? And from that point on, people respond to and understand the child in terms of the answer to that question. Even tiny newborn clothes set up differentiations between pink and blue, butterflies and tigers. Butler emphasizes that our society has extensive taboos about gender identity ranging from light teasing to legal ramifications. So even if a child's parents decide not to steer that child toward a specific gender identity, everything in our society is built on this boy-girl binary. So here's a quick example. My husband and I are both huge fans of Wonder Woman. She's one of our favorite superheroes. A few years ago, Converse announced they'd be doing a line of superhero sneakers, and Wonder Woman would be one of the superheroes. We were going to be nerdy and get matching shoes, but when we got to the store, we found out that they didn't make the Wonder Woman shoes in men's sizes. Sean didn't even have the option to break the societal taboo unless he could somehow magically shrink his feet. Now, a few years later, Converse did release a limited run of Wonder Woman shoes for men, and Sean got his shoes. But the point remains that a lot of times, even if you want to break with societal expectations about gender, society won't let you. Returning to Butler, one of the things that's key for Butler about gender identity as performative is that performance doesn't express a real gender identity. That would assume that there are real gender identities that somehow pre-existed the performance. Butler argues performance creates gender identity in the first place. As a consequence, gender cannot be understood as a role which either expresses or disguises an interior self whether that self is conceived as sexed or not. As performance which is performative, gender is an act, broadly construed, 
which constructs the social fiction of its own psychological interiority. I am suggesting that this self is not only irretrievably outside, constituted in social discourse, but that the ascription of interiority is itself a publicly regulated and sanctioned form of essence fabrication. Genders, then, can be neither true nor false, neither real nor apparent. She goes on to say, Gender is made to comply with a model of truth and falsity, which not only contradicts its own performative fluidity, but serves as a social policy of gender regulation and control. Is something tickling your mind at all? Think back a week to the concept of the simulacra. Though Butler doesn't use these terms, her notion of gender identity is surprisingly similar to Baudrillard's notion of the simulacra. Now remember, the simulacra is a copy or an image without an original. In performativity, there is no real or true gender, there's only the act of performing it. In other words, we might understand gender as a simulacra. Now Butler ends her essay with a pretty basic question. So what? Butler argues that gender essentialism is more than just philosophically untenable. It restricts people's expressions of their identities. But she also knows that just knowing about performativity as a concept isn't going to bring change on an oppressive culture. As such, she calls for, quote, a politics of performative gender acts, one which both redescribes existing gender identities and offers a prescriptive view about the kind of gender reality there ought to be. The redescription needs to expose the reification that tacitly serve as substantial gender cores or identities, and to elucidate both the act and the strategy of disavowal which at once constitute and conceal gender as we live it. Butler is keenly aware of the difficulties of this way of thinking about gender and identity, and she has continued to struggle and wrestle with the definition of performativity and what it means for identity for the whole of her career. In the end, there are two main ideas at the center of her argument. First, that gender is not only socially constructed and established, but it's also performed, and thus fluid, ever-changing, and always already an imitation. Second, because we perform gender through repetition, our agency comes in when we vary that repetition, or when we attempt to critique and transform normative performances. So what does any of this have to do with literature? Well, that's precisely what I'd like to end this lecture discussing. There are three main points I'd like you to remember as you start thinking about applying these theories to the text that we read. First, literature is a site of gender representation. It's actually a site where the constructed nature of gender is at its most clear, because the characters of the text do not have bodies. Everything we know about their gender identity is constructed by the way the authors choose to represent it. As such, we come to the second point. Literature is a part of the social structures that actively and constantly construct gender. Remember that there is no real gender these texts reveal. They perform gender into existence. How do they do that? This is the third and final point for the day. Literature uses literary devices, harken back to those earlier lectures, in order to establish, maintain, contest, and or problematize the concept of gender. Because, as we've discussed, literature can have many meanings, a text can be both progressive and conservative at the same time. It can problematize gender in one way, but establish gender essentialism in another. Pay special attention to devices like the narrator and the point of view of the text. For the next few weeks, we'll be focusing on gender performance and identity. So if you're still a little shaky on the topic, there's plenty of time to work through it. However, things might get a little more complicated when we get to comics and we throw pictures into the mix. See you next time.